The word of the Lord. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came to them a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping, taking your rest? is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Seize him. Lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day by day I was with you in the temple preaching, but you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, and he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. You may be seated. We have just heard the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Brothers. That's how you read the word. I'm going to have to gather myself, man. That was very tempting for him to sit up here and read for me what I'm about to read. But some housekeeping. Uh, I've been asked to announce that uh, just as a reminder, we've got this COVID thing going on. You may have heard about it. Um, if you find yourself stuck at home, we're on YouTube, so don't let being sick keep you from worship at Southern Hills. Uh, we're on YouTube every Sunday morning, thanks to our guys in the back. So be watching if you if find yourself having to stay home. One more announcement that when, when Frank first gave it to me, I kind of laughed it off. 
But then I got to thinking, in light of what we're going to read this morning, it's a pretty important announcement. Jacob Ramirez, I don't know how old Jacob is, lost his dog. It's a pretty big deal to a little boy. And he said, I want the church to pray for me. So let's do that. If you'll bow your heads. Father, we thank you for the stirring reading of the word. We thank you for Robert's talent and his willingness to share that with us this morning. Father, death is something we often avoid talking about, thinking about at all costs. And yet there's not one person in the room this morning that will not die. From the moment we are born, we are destined to die. And so it is so important that we are clothed with your son, Jesus. Father, little children need to learn about death, about its finality, about the sorrow and the grief that it brings. But may we as older parents and grandparents and maybe great-grandparents make sure that our children know that we will live on even though we die because we believe that Jesus is resurrection and life. And so we pray that Frank and Claudia will use this as a teaching moment for Jacob, that even though he grieves at the loss of his dog, that he knows he, if he will follow you, if he will be in Christ, if he will make good decisions, we'll live forever. May we all know that lesson, Father. And we pray it this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in January, we began a very long journey, a journey with Jesus. Age three through third grade, my apologies, a lot of housekeeping this morning. Age three through third grade, if you're a a youngster for Children's Church, just go back with Miss Stephanie and head out to the portable building. So we've been talking about Jesus for uh, seven months and a week now. Uh, I thought there would be no better way for the church to come back together as a congregation than to reacquaint ourselves with the story of Jesus. And now here we are. I'm kind of sad that this will be the last sermon from this series. There's something inside of me that says it would be a really good thing if we just went back and started over and did it again. I never get tired of thinking and talking and reading the words of Jesus. Most scholars believe that Mark's gospel ends with chapter 16, verse 8, that what you have in your Bibles after verse 8 is add-on material. Some of you may disagree with that. We can wrestle in the parking lot later. But I believe it was added at a very early date that everything added for the long ending of Mark was the practice of the early church. I believe that's what was preached in the church when they have Jesus saying, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. They preach that, and we preach that today. This morning's sermon is going to cover only the material through chapter 16, verse 8, and it's going to be a very long reading, so I hope you'll settle in. All I'm going to do is kind of give you a short introduction and then a a bit of a short conclusion, and we'll just let the text preach the sermon, as our brother has already placed us on that road this morning. Understand that that what we're going to read is the pinnacle of the book, and not just the book of Mark, it's the pinnacle of the book. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Mark wants this death to really be felt deep within our hearts. And I want us to point point out and look for, as we read through, three different emphases. You can write these down if you'd like as we go along. Uh, First emphasis is upon shame instead of pain. Now, we've all probably read medical accounts of what it's like for the human body to go through a crucifixion, the different stresses and the pain that would be endured. 
Mel Gibson, when he made his movie, The Passion of the Christ, consulted some of those medical accounts because he wanted us to understand the pain that Jesus went through when he was whipped, when he had nails driven into his hands and feet, when he had a crown of thorns pressed upon his scalp. That's what he wanted us to see. The soldiers will mock Jesus with the crown and the robe and the staff. Mark doesn't really focus on the pain. Instead, he wants us to pay attention to the shame that Jesus went through. Jesus was mocked horribly. The crowd taunted him. The Jewish authorities ridiculed him. Even the criminals who were crucified on either side taunted Jesus. And the final indignity, possibly, is that they took away all of Jesus' clothing. I know you've seen the pictures that the artists paint of Jesus on the cross and he's wearing a loincloth. That is not how they did it. Jesus was naked on that cross. He was fully exposed to every person who walked by. Shame. Look for that as we read. Second emphasis, the disciples' failure and Jesus' victory. At the beginning of the passage, Jesus is going to say to the disciples, as we read just now from Robert, you are all going to fall away. And every one of them says, not me. It won't be me that falls away. Even Peter says, I'll die with you before I fall away. But the disciples will fail. They will scatter like cockroaches on the kitchen floor when you turn the light on. They will fall away. And why not? They haven't understood what Jesus has been doing for the first time. 14 chapters of the Gospel of Mark. And after Jesus is arrested, they do the exact same thing that they swore they would never do. But then on the flip side of that is Mark's emphasis on the victory of Jesus because obedience was not easy for the human Jesus. He struggled with temptation, but he overcame it. And so while the disciples do the very thing they said they would not do, Jesus did the exact thing he said he would do. He said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had set up this contrast earlier in his teaching when he said, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. In the reading, you're going to hear Jesus confess his identity, and when he does that, he's going to receive the death sentence. As Jesus confesses his identity as the Son of God, Peter denies his identity as a disciple of Jesus. And so it's a very clear contrast. Jesus succeeds while the disciples fail. And finally, the last emphasis I'd like you to look for is this one, death instead of resurrection. Now, we don't like death. We've kind of talked about that already. We don't like to talk about death. We don't even like to think about death. And we certainly don't like a dead Jesus. We don't like Jesus on the cross. We want the risen Jesus out of the tomb, ascended to heaven, sitting at the Father's right hand. That's the Jesus we'd rather picture in our minds. But Mark will not allow us to have that picture. Mark wants us to see the death. Now, Mark believes in the resurrection. It's just not what he emphasizes. We will not have any resurrection appearances in the Gospel of Mark. We never actually see the risen Jesus. All we get is a report that Jesus has risen. Mark wants us to focus not on the resurrection, but on the death of Jesus. And he wants that death to impact us deeply. And so Mark will highlight the Roman pagan Gentile centurion who, when Jesus breathes his last breath, makes a great confession. He sees how Jesus dies, and he says, surely this man was the Son of God. Mark will point to Jesus on the cross, and he whispers to us, that is what God did for you. That is what God did to save you. 
because he loves you so much. So we're going to pick up now where Robert left off. Hear now the word of the Lord. They led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. 
And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait. Let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. 
see the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now that's an odd ending. What a strange way for it to end. I don't like that ending. Who wants it to end that way? They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. People haven't liked that ending for centuries. And so it appears that when Matthew and Luke took Mark's gospel as source material for their own gospels, they both wrote a better ending. And even with Mark's gospel, very early on, someone attached an ending to it. And in fact, there are two endings, one known as the short ending, the other as the longer ending, the more popular one that was originally in your King James Version and therefore has made its way down to us in our modern translations. Interestingly, if we have anyone carrying a new Revised Standard Version, you get both endings in that version. So you get to choose. Which ending do you like better? Which one do you prefer? Because we don't like the ending Mark has given us. An ending that ends on a note of fear. Because we want to know what happens next. We've read through this whole gospel and now we want to know what happens next. Do the women overcome their fear? Do they go and tell the disciples? Do the disciples then go back to Galilee like they're supposed to? We want to know. Galilee. You remember Galilee? Galilee's where it all started. We began our journey with Jesus in Galilee. That's where Jesus first called, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's in Galilee where we saw the healings, the leper, the paralyzed man let down through the roof. Even Peter's mother was sick. Jesus touched her and she got up and fixed everybody's supper. Galilee. We remember the man with a shriveled hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. The religious leaders were looking to accuse Jesus when he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and when he did, it was healed. Galilee, where the lame and the blind were healed, where the demons were cast out, where 5,000 people were fed, where Jesus walked on the water. All of that was back up in Galilee. Why didn't the disciples get it there? Why didn't they get it back in Galilee? They should have been paying better attention. Why don't we get it? Why don't we pay better attention? See, having now witnessed the story, I think we can be much better followers of Jesus compared to what we were maybe even back in January. Is it possible that we too need to metaphorically go back to Galilee and begin again? Because that's part of the message that Mark wants us to get. Jesus says to the apostles, let's have a do-over. Let's begin again. You'll do better this time. Jesus says to the ladies, tell the disciples and Peter, get back to Galilee. I want to meet with them there because we're going to start over. We're going to have a new beginning. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm going to teach you how to catch people. Let's start again. 
There is a definite emphasis on Galilee, isn't there? Early in the reading, 1428, that Robert read for, for us, Jesus says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then there at the very end, the angel says, but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They need to get back to Galilee. Folks, we need to get back to Galilee. How do we do that? I think it starts with us seeing the need to get back to Galilee. The need for us to realize that we have failed in being what Jesus wants us to be. That's where it has to start. It begins with us recognizing our need for a Savior. Oh, we really do need a Savior. And maybe we didn't understand that the first time through. But now it's clear. We really do need Jesus. Peter realized it. The disciples realized it. Because you see, church, it is our failures that show us how much we need Jesus. How much we need to pay attention to him and really listen to his words. We really need to stop trying to run our own lives. We need to stop doing the things that make sense to us. And instead, pay attention to him. We need to watch him and follow him. I've got to tell you, I had to fight back the tears, as Robert read moments ago. I want to ask you, when was the last time you were moved to tears thinking about the death of Jesus? Can you remember? When was the last time that the death of Jesus just grabbed your heart? you came to this realization that he really did die for my sins. When was the last time you were really honest within yourself about how much you really do need Jesus? See, when the apostles get back to Galilee, they really will do a lot better job following Jesus. A lot better than the first time, and so will we. The journey always begins the same way. When we start out following, we answer the call. We follow Jesus as best we can, but we, under, we misunderstand some things. We get distracted. At times, we will wander off the pathway. We will fail to be the person Jesus has called us to be, but we don't quit. Because at that very moment, the moment of failure, if we will just look up, we will find ourselves once again at the foot of the cross where Jesus gave his life as a ransom for our sin. And so Jesus says, let's start over. Because this time you'll do a whole lot better. You've learned some things. So let's go back to Galilee. Jesus will be there. He will invite us to follow him all over again. You've heard the gospel this morning. This is good news. That's how the whole book started. You remember? Verse 1, chapter 1, the good news of Jesus the Messiah. And the good news is not how successful we are. It's not about how accomplished we are. That's not the good news. The good news is that in spite of our failures, Jesus is victorious. He's victorious. 
He accomplished what he set out to do in spite of temptation, in spite of obstacle, in spite of his prayer in the garden. Please, Father, I don't want to do this. And then he did it anyway. Now that's good news. He did it for us. Didn't do it for himself. Left up to him, he would have done something completely different. But he did what he did. For you and me, and for the 12, even though they were failing the whole time, he did it for them anyway. And then he said, let's start over. Let's begin again. You see, Mark's gospel ends so abruptly because we write the ending. The story of the church is not yet finished. It's not over. Only when the disciples go back to Galilee do they see the resurrected Jesus. And folks, it is only when we live in obedience to him that we see the resurrected Jesus. When we come to truly know him. How does Mark's gospel end? Church family, that's up to us. Kevin, I want to thank you for your talk at the table this morning. If you're in Christ, that's good. He's the Savior. He's the one who died for you. That's how much he loves you. If there is anybody here this morning who is not in Christ, that is not good. Because Jesus says, I'm coming back. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Our prayer is that you would confess your faith in him. You would come confessing that everything we read this morning is the truth. You believe it. You trust it. You trust that his blood can take away your sin.